Dynamic range is an important aspect of photography when editing photos because it determines the range of brightness or luminosity that a camera can capture in a single image. When a camera has a wide dynamic range, it can capture all the details in both the bright and dark areas of a scene, resulting in a more balanced and natural looking image. When a camera has a narrow dynamic range, it can't capture all the details in both the bright and dark areas of a scene, and thus resulting in overexposed highlights and underexposed shadows. Of course, high-end cameras do come with a wider dynamic range, so if you're shooting with an entry-level camera, you can counter that problem by making use of exposure bracketing. This means taking multiple photos of the same scene at different exposure settings, which you can later combine to an HDR photo using software like Lightroom or Photoshop. This high dynamic range image will give you way more flexibility during the post-processing. When editing photos, it is important to have a good understanding of dynamic range. This allows you to recover details in the highlights and the shadows and create a more balanced image. For example, in Lightroom or Photoshop, you can use techniques such as adjusting the exposure, contrast, highlights and shadows to increase the dynamic range of an image. This will make the image appear more natural with greater range of tonal values. Just take a look at this unedited RAW file. Out of the camera, this image looks very dark, but seeing the scene in person it's completely different since the human eye can compute an insanely wide dynamic range. This is where we make use of the RAW file's dynamic range and a bit of editing to bring the photo more in line with what it really looked like. So opening up the basic panel will of course reveal the exposure adjustments Right away for a dark image like this, it makes sense to just bring up the exposure, while always keeping an eye on the histogram. I would say right about here the foreground looks like it would look in nature, but of course due to the increased exposure we end up with overexposed areas right there in the sky. You can also see that on the histogram on the right side. Since this is a raw file of a modern day camera, we can just bring down the highlights and you can see how we can bring things more in line with each other. So the sky isn't as blown out as before, we do still have a little bit of an exposure, but it looks way more natural in this case. At this point, the very near foreground still has some very dark areas that has to do with the fact I was using a polarization filter which just reduces the reflection on the water surface. But we can fix that area by just bringing up the shadows a notch and again just trying to get a natural look on this image by making use of the dynamic range of this file. At this point this looks really natural. If you want you can go further, for example bringing down the whites a bit and try fixing the overexposed parts. All the while you can see playing around with those sliders will change the histogram as well. So at this point there shouldn't be any overexposure and no underexposure. We have a rather flat looking image but that's mostly what it's like in nature in person at this scene at that moment. To further bring things in line we could play around with the black slider by just increasing it slightly. And at this point I would say we have a very natural looking image. So here we have the dark raw file straight out of the camera looking very unnatural. And here we have the edited version where we have changed the image to a more natural look with just a few exposure adjustments. By the way, this original raw file was captured in such a way that I was very close to overexposing the image, which results in no overexposure but I have almost all the details in the shadows and the highlights, so I can make use of the whole dynamic range of the camera to do with this image whatever I want. Now back to the edited version. As stated many times, this is the most natural look, but you don't always want to have the most natural look. At least for my style of photo editing, I do want to change the images quite dramatically. At this point, we're pretty much done with the dynamic range tutorial. 
and I do want to continue showing you the complete post-processing for this shot, which will look completely different than it is looking now. So let me reset the basic settings real quick and let's jump into it by going into the geometry tab. I'm starting here because you can see those vertical lines are not really vertical. I want to fix that, which is super easy done in the geometry tab. Just go with the vertical slider and I'm going to push it a bit. The grid will help you aligning those lines pretty nicely. So that's looking much better already. There are gaps in the upper corners of the image, but I'm going to fix it later in Photoshop, so don't worry about them. Next up, I'm going to change the profile from Adobe Color to Adobe Standard, just to bring in some more brightness on the darkest parts. Overall, I want the scene to be rather dark, but I do want to increase the exposure just a bit. I'm also going to drop the highlights trying to prevent too much overexposure and then I'm bringing up the shadows a notch just like that. You see the image is still rather dark but we have a lot more details in the darkest areas. Now to add contrast I'm going to bring down the blacks. Looking at this program you can see we will end up with underexposure but that's mostly in those vignetting areas in the upper corners. So that's okay. Then I also want this image to look sharp and clear so I'm bringing up the texture and the clarity. And for stronger colors let's bring up the vibrance and the saturation. Okay looking good so far. Compared to the raw file, you can see we have fixed the shadows quite a bit and the colors do look a little colder than before. Now let's continue applying some masking. And I'd like to start by changing the sky. So here let's use a linear gradient. I'm going to target all the sky with a very rough edge like this. And here let's bring up the contrast because I want to make the clouds pop. And I'm also going to introduce temperature, making the sky warmer, which always looks nice for those sunsets. And we could even boost the saturation a bit. All right, looking much better already. Then I do think about adding some glow. Therefore, I'm using a radial gradient. And I'm just going to apply it right there on the center, making it really thin. Just bringing up the blacks in here and adding a little bit of negative dehaze. All right, looks good. Then let's work on the foreground. For that I'm using another linear gradient, again with a very rough edge. Here I do want to bring up the whites, just brightening up this image in the foreground. And at the same time, I'm bringing up the temperature to fix that cold color cast. So that's looking much, much better. And then I do want to bring back some darkness. Again, I'm using a linear gradient and I'm targeting most of the foreground. Just like that. And I'm going to drop the exposure. And I don't care about an exposure at all. So to me, this looks really, really good. Maybe I'm even raising this linear gradient slightly. All right, then finally, I do want to add one more radial gradient covering the whole width of the image. In here, I'm bringing up the whites. I'm also bringing up the blacks for a very subtle glow effect. And then finally, let's add some saturation. All right, perfect. Now that is the image after the masking adjustments. You can see without and here with the masking. Looks much more dramatic. Now let's continue giving this image some color. I am going to do this by solely relying on the color grading panel for some split toning. Let's start with the highlights and the most dramatic change. Since we want to have warm highlights, I of course will go with the warmer hue. So maybe somewhere this range and I'm going to really pump up the saturation here. Just like that. Then I am going 
into the midtones and again just go with a warm hue and again bring up the saturation a lot. Of course we don't want to get overwhelmed by warm color tones so let's go into the shadows and also introduce some blue with a lot of saturation again. And that's looking like some lovely color grading. Finally, let's open up the calibration tab. In here, I am going to drop the blue primary hue and again raise the saturation. Perfect. And that's the image after the color grading doesn't have much in common with the raw file from the start. So one more thing I want to do here is the sharpening in the details tab. Here, let's bring down the radius, increase the details, add a bit of masking, and then of course, some more sharpening. And with that, we are done with the raw adjustments. We can now open this up in Photoshop to apply the final retouching. Of course, I first want to fix those gaps and the vignetting. For that, I'm going to grab the last tool, I'm making a very rough selection and then hit Shift F5, choose Content Aware and hit OK. This looks pretty good. Let's try the same on the other side. I think this might be a bit harder to fix. It does look quite good, but there are some strange things going on. So I'm going to use the Clone Stem tool. Just try to fix those weird things. Now let's work on the colors some more. I'm going to the adjustment layers. Here I'm choosing a photo filter, which will just add some more warmth to the image. And I'm going to bring up the density, which in, in turn makes the colors more intense. This is a pretty cool effect, but I'm losing quite a bit of cold color tones in the foreground and the sky. So I'm going to make use of that layer mask and I'm going to bring back those colder color tones. I'm going to hit G to bring up the gradient tool. And you can see I have a gradient selected going from black to transparent. And I'm going to create a straight one going up the image like this. Since I applied that on the layer mask, we are going to reveal the original blue color tones from below. I'm going to do the same on the sky, but I'm not going to make a big gradient, just a small one like this to reveal some subtle hint of blue at the very top. This is looking really, really good. We can make those colors a little more intense by using a color balance adjustment layer. Here, I'm not I don't want to change the midtones, but I want to change the highlights. I'm going to bring up the slider slightly to the red side. Don't want to overdo it just a little bit. Should be enough already. And at the same time, let's go into the shadows and just add a very subtle amount of blue to them. Just one point should be enough. Very subtle change, but I like it. Finally, I do want to add a little bit of Orton Glow. So first, let me merge everything. Therefore, I'm hitting Ctrl Shift Alt E. Then I'm hitting Ctrl Alt 2, which selects the highlights of the image, which I then copy by hitting Ctrl C and Ctrl V to pass them in a new layer. With that new layer selected, I'm going to filter, blur, Gaussian blur. I think this looks pretty good this way. So I'm going to just hit OK, switch the blending mode of that layer to screen, and I'm bringing down the opacity. And thus we just create a very subtle glow effect. I could maybe raise the opacity slightly, but I think this looks great. One final thing I'd like to apply is some more vibrance. So let's add a vibrance adjustment layer and just bring up the vibrance. Then I do think the upper corners look strange with that added vibrance. So I'm just going to use the brush tool with the black foreground color and just brush over those corners up there. And here we have the finished image. So I hope this tutorial was interesting as well as the editing part. Of course, if you have any questions left, feel free to ask in the comments and thank you very much for watching this video.